my name is Mike Tomiansky and my topic is neuroprotection within a decade, the good and bad news. Mike, what are some of the big issues in neuroprotection these days? Well, basically, in my view, there are two important unanswered questions. The first one is, in neuro is neuroprotection in humans actually possible? And the other is, if it's possible, due to the complexities of human stroke and the human brain, is it actually practicable? Um, the reality is that all the clinical trials that have been done to date have failed, and we never know whether they failed because the neuroprotectant wasn't actually effective, so we didn't have a tool with which to decide whether or not it was the clinical trial design that failed us, or whether the neuroprotectant didn't work and the clinical trial design was fine. So if you're trying to deal with community-acquired stroke, the first question that you have to answer is, is there a tool? Is neuroprotection actually feasible? What I've talked about today at, at our session is that over the last decade and a half, we've developed a class of neuroprotectants called PSD95 inhibitors that have gone through multiple rat studies according to the STAIR criteria, also primate studies that we published in Nature this year, and a human clinical trial showing efficacy in humans in reducing MRI damage of strokes. So for the first time in the history of stroke, we've been able to answer that first question. The issue is, is neuroprotection possible? Yes, it's possible in rats, in primates, and in humans. So now that we have a tool that has the necessary biological effect, the question is, can we use that in a clinical trial scenario that will make neuroprotection practicable for community-acquired stroke? We are no longer in the era of the pre-TPA era, and because of this, we can't just conduct a drug versus placebo trial the way that the TPA trials could be conducted when there was nothing out there. Any clinical trial design has to take into account the various delays that are imposed by the assessment of a patient for candidacy for standard of care treatment like TPA. And these delays would also delay the time at which a neuroprotectant can then be given. And the one thing that we do know about stroke is that time is brain. And by the time that three to four hours come around, there really isn't a lot of brain left to save. So any clinical trial design that waits three to four hours before a neuroprotectant is administered is unlikely to detect the small effect size of neuroprotection in that time frame. And all the clinical trials to date, none of them with the exception of FASTMAG, which is not yet reported, and the uh, clinical trial that we recently conducted in ACT that gave the neuroprotectant within two hours, none of the trials ever recruited patients in a time frame less than four hours. So it's very possible that even if these neuroprotectants worked, that the clinical trials recruited patients in a time frame where neuroprotection really wasn't practical. So what we're now planning to do is to do a trial very similar to FASTMAG, but this time with a neuroprotectant that's been validated to have the necessary biological efficacy in rats, primates, and humans. So this trial is called Frontier, and uh, we hope to start it by the end of this year. And if that trial is successful, it'll give the necessary signal for neuroprotection to really be realized. So we do think that neuroprotection is possible within a decade, and we actually believe that getting a signal for yay or nay for neuroprotection is achievable within the next three years. That's very helpful. So my topic is uh, quite a bit different. I'm talking about race, ethnic uh, disparities throughout the globe. And um, I don't know if you saw the Lancet Neurology, Lancet article in December of 2012 that documented uh, global rank in terms of mortality throughout the world and showed what is really called the epidemiologic transition that uh, causes of death are migrating dramatically from communicable to non-communicable causes of death. And stroke is number two, has been number two for at least 20 years, but has grown like 27%. And in terms of global years lost, uh, stroke is remarkably expanding, 177% over the last uh, two decades. So more and more, stroke is becoming very important. And even in the West, where we know that stroke mortality and stroke incidence has declined dramatically for decades, there still is a remarkable disparity where people who are minority populations or low socioeconomic status groups have a much higher burden of stroke. And so data from the community that I work in in South Texas 
shows parallel declines in terms of incidence rates, but still a much higher uh, risk of stroke in Mexican Americans compared to non-Hispanic whites. And so I think that as we move forward for the next few decades, we need to think about these disparities and make them high priority in our research agendas, in our advocacy agendas, and in what we do every day as clinicians in the clinic, where we should spend a couple of extra moments trying to figure out whether our patients can actually afford the medications that we're assigning to them, and what are the barriers for prevention and getting therapy. It's interesting the decisions that we make in healthcare these days. Uh, there was a recent estimate that an acute stroke intervention costs over $10,000, but a month's supply of hydrochlorothiazide to lower blood pressure costs four bucks. So I think as uh, individuals who uh, treat uh, stroke patients throughout the world, we as a society in the American Stroke Association need to have some advocacy for how we're going to spend our money and what we're going to do to reduce the tremendous explosion of stroke in developing countries and among the minorities and poor. So what should be the top three priorities in this advocacy? Well, I think that uh, we first need to talk about where we're going to spend our money. And uh, I think that there is very little money spent on global health disparities in developing countries, but this is going to impact everybody throughout the world. So number one, I think that there ought to be some statements and some direct um, uh, attempts to have funding agencies look at global impact of stroke. I think number two, we need to focus more on, uh, even in the West, on stroke in minority populations. And finally, we need to think more as individuals rather than just on the expensive new cool gizmos, what we will do with, uh, for outreach in our own communities. Thank you.